Thank you so much for listening to Breadwinning Mums. We really appreciate your continued support over the last year, and we're happy to announce that we have published the Breadwinning Mums book. Yay! This book is based on the conversations from the Breadwinning Mums season one episodes. It highlights the candid journeys of each mums, as well as a golden nugget of wisdom from their life's lessons. Now is the perfect time to give the gift of the Breadwinning Mums book to the special mums in your life or to yourself. No matter where you are in life, I'm sure the practical tips within the Breadwinning Mums book will help you take your lives just a little bit further. Limited copies available, so order yours now at breadwinningmums.com. That's breadwinningmums.com. Coming up next on the Breadwinning Mums. How much is enough? I was always striving and I think we're in a society, you know, where we are sold the idea of constantly striving means that we will be happy. But um, it comes at the cost of rest and joy and presence. And I think if you're not clear on how much is enough, you'll spend your whole life striving and then one day you'll be old and go, I wasn't in life. I wasn't present and the one thing I hear the most and the one thing that I wanted when my son was young was to be more present so if you want to be more present I'd say get really clear on how much is enough to the Breadwinning Mums podcast. This is a place where we debunk the myths of working mums, cheer each other on, and show the world that it's okay to be a mum and still pursue excellence in your chosen area of expertise. Today we're chatting with Penny Locasso, a fellow breadwinning mum to a teenage son and a black Labrador named Tilly. Penny is a transformation coach, global speaker, published author, and the founder of HackingHappy.co. Penny shared with us her life story about leaving a global giant and long-term marriage, going through various life transformations to find her place as a transformation coach for busy women. Here we go with Penny Lacasso. Hello, Penny. Hey, Jane. Thanks so much for inviting me along. Thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to have someone of your caliber join us. Um, But I know that a lot of people that are listening may not know who you are yet. So can Mm. we probably start with that? Mm. Oh, I love this question because I never answer it the same way. Um, So I am not defined by a a role. Mm. I am a human being for first and foremost, um, a beautifully flawed one at that. So I like to think of myself as an imperfect experimenter because that gives me permission to try loads of different things and see what lands for myself and my clients. I am a mother of two, a 13-year-old soccer nut and a big black Labrador named Tilly. <laughs> uh, I am a very passionate yogi. I'm a weightlifter. I am a hiker and a lover of nature and someone who can so often see the potential in those who cannot see it themselves. Mm, Interesting. Okay. And when did you first start getting to even become curious about experimenting, Mm. about 
constantly learning? Was it something that was innate within you from a very early age or is it something that you learned through life experiences? Yeah. So I would say I was always a learner um, and I thought I was extremely curious when I was in my corporate career, but um, I've since learned that perhaps I wasn't as curious as I would have liked to have thought. So I was very good always at learning and expanding myself, but very much in traditional ways. So within the constructs of ticking boxes, you know, go to uni, get a great job, maybe do an MBA, like, you know, all the things that we're taught will help us become successful and thus happiness. And so I got to the age of 39 and I ticked a number of those boxes and created a very successful career in a global giant. And there was like a series of events that kind of occurred in my life. And it was like a, I would say it was like a dimmer that gradually got turned up and then the light got so strong that I couldn't ignore it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was perhaps when the first really big experiment in my life took place. Mm -hmm. So I found myself having ticked all the boxes I had from the outside looking in a very perfect life. And I was sitting there unfulfilled and I had a three-year-old son and all he wanted was my time. And all I was doing was being busy working on the future. So mm. I turned everything upside down in pursuit of happiness. So I left a, what I do, I left a 16-year career as an executive in a global giant as a woman with high potential, which I always love that term because I'm yet to meet one with no potential. I relocated my family from Perth back to Melbourne, left an 18-year relationship and started my own company all within seven months. And that was the beginning, I think, of true learning in my mm. life without construct, without safety nets, you know, um, doing things completely differently. And, you know, they say, you know, um, jumping and, and trusting that the net will appear. Yep. And how did the net appear? Net. <laughs> Soon after or a very long stretch no, Within so the-, the soon after is bullshit, right? It doesn't yeah. exist. I yeah. have I have spent years working with successful entrepreneurs. Some of them have made hundreds of millions of dollars. Others are just lifestyle, you know, business owners. Mm-hmm. And I'm yet to hear anyone uh, basically turn on a business and overnight, you know, it's been a huge success. success. Yeah. And I just think that's the greatest misnomer people are sold um, yeah. ever. Yeah. So how, like, I would say I'm still trying to work it out, right? So when I say I'm still trying to work it out, it's been nine years, but I've evolved. And so I continue to experiment, but the experiments I now take are way more courageous than I would have back then, even though yeah. that shift sounds crazy, because I know that it really doesn't matter how things work out. The growth and the opportunity that comes from stepping into fear yeah, yeah, is like it's it's like it's always life changing in a positive way, yeah. Um, because it teaches you how to navigate uncertainty from a place of intention and meaning, which yep. is always fulfilling, right? And it means that opportunities that you hadn't considered mm. start to appear. Mm. Wow, perfect! Thank you so much for sharing. And I think knowing that you've gone through the fire and being able to come out the other side, whole and perhaps better than how you were before made all that, you know, transition, all that option a lot more easier? I don't think it's ever easy. So I think that's the first thing. I think reflect, like when you're on the other side of it, it's like, oh, yeah, that was worthwhile, right? But Mm. I'm studying trauma with Dr. Gabor Maté, who's one of the top trauma psychotherapists in the world at the moment, and Mm. I've been doing that for six months, got another six months to go, and um, it's been... It's been absolutely transformative. And he says this magic little quote that, again, has changed my whole perspective and especially in in how I work with my clients. And he says, where there's tension, pay attention. So as humans, we're so good at resisting the tension, like we're wired for safety. That's what our central nervous system does. You know, it tries to protect us, as does our brain. It's why we have an amygdala. Mm. And yet um, often it's, you know, your body and your brain suppressing the shit stuff, the stuff that doesn't feel great, um, which doesn't act in your service because the suppression means that you're not processing and dealing with things that often hold the greatest growth or they hold you back from realising the true potential that you have. Yeah. 
Interesting. Okay. I'd like to go back to that time in 2014 when you've decided to end a corporate job. Yeah. In the 18 years relationship as well. Yeah. Did it all happen at the in the same year? Yeah. Seven months. Okay. Which <laughs> one do you think in hindsight was the hardest step to take? Uh I definitely think getting divorced is probably because it's not just you involved, right? Like you leave a corporate career and you leave a stack of money and you leave, you know, what feels safe. But Mm -hmm. um, uh, divorce, as a child of divorce, my mum and dad, my dad has not spoken to my mum since I was 11 years old. Um, I've seen and experienced firsthand the impact that has long-term on children. Mm. So that was a decision that I didn't take lightly. And, um, you know, I've got to say I'm extremely proud of how my ex-husband and I managed it. There were no lawyers. You know, we did everything ourselves and it was extremely amicable. But it it doesn't, even though I'm proud of it, it doesn't take away that it, it was still painful for my son and he was only four years old, you know. So that was probably the hardest thing was knowing that I had to make a choice um, for my own happiness mm. that was going to seriously impact the life of someone small that I really loved. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you for mm. uh, opening up. Um, divorce and separation is something that a lot of people can relate to, but not necessarily being open to sharing. Mm. Um, and so only, and only if you're open um, to share maybe some tips as to um, how to navigate that turbulent time from the moment when you have decided that, yes, this is no longer serving myself or my kid or my family, and it's probably time to move on until you found a sense of new balance with your new family, new state of family. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would say, I mean, you're in the financial industry, right? The reason that it was able to be the way that it was was I was in, I would say, a unique situation where we were both financially independent. So even though we'd been together nearly 20 years, we still had separate money and I had earned as much as my husband. So, and I hate, like I hate to say it, but because I was financially independent in my own right, I wasn't dependent on him, it made the separation a lot easier. And sadly, what I see is most women are not in that situation because by the nature of our role, you know, the caring role, we step out, we have children, we sacrifice salary, we sacrifice superannuation. And often, you know, a lot of women are reliant on their partners, not always, you know, but I see it every day. And therefore, and that's part of the reason why they don't leave and they stay in unhappy relationships. But not having that financial independence makes separation, it gets a lot, it gets a lot messier because it's impractical. Yeah. Often the fight is over money, right? Which mm. is terrible. And unfortunately, there is no clear cut way to place a value on the amazing job that many women do as mothers and the sacrifice that that comes with. There's no value mm. on that. It's shit, mm. but it's the nature of what it is. Mm. So that's the first thing I'd say. I would I would always say. Work out a way to, um, if you can, maintain your financial independence in some way, shape or form. And Mm -hmm. I hate to say this, but I always say it's great to have, I call it like an an escape fund. You know, a lot of women don't even have enough money to leave, to set set up like, you know, even a rental property. Um, So I would just say when you go into a relationship, thinking about these things is actually very healthy. It's not setting yourself up for a separation. In terms of managing it, I, for us, the conversation I always had is I will always do what is in the best interests of my son. And I knew going to war with my ex-husband was not going to make his life pleasant. Mm -hmm. And so I said to my ex-husband, I will, I will work with you as long as we make the common agreement that we will both operate in the best interests of our son, not in our own individual best interests. And I think that was a really good start point because I think a lot of people forget about the children. Mm. And like I say, I've seen firsthand the long-term damage that it does because it is a trauma and, you know, it can impact the rest of their lives. Now, 
now you are in a relationship with someone who cares deeply about you. Um, would you say that building a long-term relationship this time around is a lot easier because of what you've learned in the past? Or is it just because of the nature of it's a different person, different time, different perspective? Mm. It's a completely different relationship. These are great context. questions, Jane. No one's ever asked me this. this is, I love it. Um, I have an amazing partner and I seriously think it was pure luck. <laughs> it wasn't by design. Um, I wasn't even looking for a relationship. I'd only been separated from my ex-husband for a year and um, I just wanted a companion, you know, someone to hang out with. I was starting my own business. I had a four-year-old son. You know, I didn't need a man to get married. I didn't need another child. I didn't need money. I just yeah. wanted some company that was mentally stimulating that I could hang out with once a week and wasn't going to ask too much of me. And I ended up with an amazing partner who I've now been with eight years. I think what happens, and, and this is a really good basis for any change, right? Most women are really clear on what they don't want, right, yep. when they want to make change, but we're often not clear on what we do want. Yeah. And I think often it's because we just, we're so busy, we don't have the space to think about that, right? Yeah. So creating the space to actually say, what is it I don't want? And therefore, mm. what are some of the things that I do want? So I was very clear on what I didn't want. I didn't mm. want someone to come into my home and try and pretend to be a father to my child. I didn't need that. Mm. Um, I wanted someone that was not needy because, you know, I had a I had my own life and I wanted someone who had their own life as well because I actually think it's really healthy to have, you know, different interests. But I also wanted to have some shared interests. So um, we have a very unconventional relationship. We've been together for eight years. We do not live together. Um, my boyfriend comes over every Friday night and stays for the whole weekend. Often he'll come once a week and we'll go out for lunch in the middle of the day. Like, And him and my son, and completely um, unexpectedly, they're like best mates. They <laughs> okay. have very similar interests and um, that's been really organic and it's magical. So I kind of... Yeah, I don't know how it happened, but it's completely different. And I think the basis for it was knowing I was very clear on what I didn't want. And so I suppose I made sure that whatever I got was not that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It kind of worked out. <laughs> Sounds like uh, you lucked out. Okay. Um, can you tell us back to the young Penny? What was the young Penny like? Oh, wow. <laughs> These are good questions. A lot of vodka. <laughs> no one's ever asked me this stuff. Um, I would say young Penny, I grew up on farms and so young Penny was always very, um, I would say, confident, very independent, very resilient, um, which I think most of the women or even the children of farmers generally are from my experience. Um, she was someone who would love to be like outdoors, was always riding horses, was always doing stuff on the farm with my brother and sister, um, you know, adventurous. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds a lot like uh, what I'm seeing right now. <laughs> so yeah, but I think it's funny. You come full circle. I do think, you know, it's it's interesting with all the work that I've been doing in my studies in psychology and trauma therapy, like you cannot um, support people with this stuff that I'm learning unless you do the work on yourself. And what I've come to realise is that my job is not to change or fix people, even though a lot of people come to me wanting that. My job is actually to help women strip back the layers of should and the unrealistic expectations that they and society have placed on them so they can actually return to their essence. They can return to this magical human that they were born to be before all these layers of should were piled upon and sort of dimmed the light. Mm -hmm. And so my job is really helping women to allow their light to shine again. And it's, you know, it's it's almost like returning them to the woman they forgot they were. Mm. Wow. That's really deep. I suspect it takes a long time for people to do that or it's just a matter of finding the right time for that specific person. It takes two things. It takes a a commitment to practice and experimentation, right? Because what you're trying to do is unravel conditioned beliefs. Mm. And those beliefs, you know, are also often attached, well, they're often driven by ego. So um, a lot of what these 
um, it's not, it's definitely not easy work. It's certainly not impossible work. It is completely possible. But you are removing years of belief systems and behaviours and it takes time to reprogram those neural pathways to believe that things could be different. And a great example is a lot of women feel selfish when they do things for themselves. Mm. And that can be, I mean, you're a mum. Yeah, you would be a prime example of this. Mm -hmm. You know, women are always, in my experience, and I'm generalising, but from the women that I work with, and they're all high-performing, successful women, they more often than not are at the bottom of their to-do list. Their belief is that when I get it all done, then I'll make time for me. But the reality is it's never all done. And all they keep moving, doing is moving themselves and their dreams to the bottom of the to-do list. Yeah. You know, and so you're basically rewiring your brain to actually say, giving back to myself is not the reward when everything's done. It's actually the foundation for me being able to do the things for the people I love. Because if I don't look after myself, if I don't put myself first, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when your system will actually shut down. You will burn out. And I am seeing burnout uh, in high-performing women that have never had mental health issues, never burnt out at rates that are pervasive at the Mm. moment. Mm. Okay, interesting. Um, I know that you mentioned before that you don't define yourself by what you do. But through all of the iterations that you've uh, lived on before working for Shell, uh, creating your own company, how would you describe what you do? What's the life for you like right now in terms of your professional mm. career? Oh, you know, it's really interesting that you asked this because I I rewrote my purpose the other day because I just started doing, here you go, my, I did doing my planning for next year because, again, I feel like I'm in version 4.0 of Penny. That's where I'm heading. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And so um, if I had to define sort of the umbrella, my purpose around what I do, I empower women to reconnect with their wholeness so that they can flourish, creating a ripple effect of flourishing in the ones they love in society. So I want women who want to do the work to define what flourishing looks like on their terms because it's different for each and every one of us. And I want to support them in learning really simple and practical ways to bring more of that into every day via mindset and behaviour. Mm. Love it. Why have you chosen women as opposed to any people, mm. anyone? Because... Again, through my study. So I work with men. I have men reach out. I'm not adverse to working with men. It's nothing around that. But what I have discovered through um, my research and the studies that I've done in my side is that women basically are the foundational carers in our society. So they take on the weight of caring roles, be it with children, yeah, and be it with the elderly. So I feel my belief system is, and, and and women are burning out at rates we've never seen before, I believe that if I can support women in flourishing, mm. the like I said, the ripple effects on the children, the next generation, and equally on those that are exiting our world is significant because of the caring role that they play in society. And for me, I just think, That's what I want to give my energy to because if I can help one woman to flourish, the on-flow effects of her flourishing to be it her children, be it the people that are around her or be it, you know, her elders that she cares for um, Mm -hmm. are likely to be significant. If you had to boil down the um, the tools that you share with these women to flourish, would you be able to find three main things that any women can do in order to flourish in their own respective definitions? Mm, I can give you three little tiny things because I'm all mm. about the simple stuff. So, I mean, obviously every client is different, so I have a huge toolkit and I kind of, and sometimes, you know, and I'm constantly building on it. And a lot of the stuff I share, I use myself because I like to be my own guinea pig. But there's a couple of things that I would share that will probably be helpful to any of your listeners who perhaps um, are busy and exhausted 
especially as we move towards the end of the year. The first one um, is a beautiful little hack that I learned this year through my trauma studies. And I think one of the biggest gaps that women have is we are very good as nurturers and carers at being compassionate to others. We're unbelievably good people-pleasing perfectionists, but we are not compassionate to ourselves. And I believe that lack of self-compassion, again, holds you back, right? Because negative inner dialogue is going to impact your confidence and your ability to believe in yourself. So every day when you are bagging yourself out, when you're telling yourself, I haven't done it all, I should have done this, and you feel like it's not enough and you're not enough, the question that you ask yourself is what would self-compassion look like for me today? What would it look like? And then you go and do that small thing. Hmm. So I ask myself that all the time. The second thing that I would give them is I believe the word busy is bullshit. I believe it holds no value uh, or meaning whatsoever. And often it is code for something else. And so I say to people, first and foremost, understand what your busy is code for. So the last time you use the word busy, what were you really saying? What was the narrative in your head? Nice. Yeah, and why why are you not saying that thing? Yep. Yeah. Often what women are saying is I'm exhausted and I'm overwhelmed and I just can't take on anymore. Mm. And if that's what your response is, then maybe it's time to ask for help and use that as an indicator that it's okay to ask for help. Mm. I also say don't use the word busy. So busy basically spins the hamster wheel faster. So remove it from your vocabulary for a week and see what happens. That's two. And the third thing that has fundamentally changed my life um, is a beautiful little act called micro bravery. Like so many women that I meet have great ideas, amazing things that they want to do, but they think that if they do a really good job, they'll get noticed and they'll get promoted or the opportunities will present. And I'm here to tell you that most people are not mind readers. So if you don't get out there and start asking for what you want, it's not It's not going to happen. It's not magic. It doesn't land on your door. So there's this beautiful little practice called micro bravery and it's doing one small thing every day that makes you feel uncomfortable, one small thing that scares you. And here's the thing, every time you do it, it builds your courage and confidence to step into bigger acts of micro bravery over time. And those acts will blow you away and the opportunities that you get as a result of stepping into your fear, stepping into your courage, I guarantee you it will shift your life. It's a practice though. Mm, nice. I love that it's uh, that is a practice because nothing comes easy and every day is an iterative process from the day yeah. before. So how are you juggling work and family lives at the moment? You have a teenager, a business that you run. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you make it all work? <laughs> this has been a practice, right? And I'm not perfect by any stretch, but I I kind of feel like I've found my flow. Um, so for me, I am someone who knows from all of my study that the only way I can be productive and operate at my best and give what I want to give to the world is to put myself first. So every morning during the week, um, I do stuff for me. So I often don't start work until... 8.30, 9 o'clock, and I get up at 5 a.m. So we're talking mm-hmm. a good three and a half, four hours before I do any work. And in that time, and look, I've got a 13-year-old son, right? So if you've got young children, this is not your definition of what it should like. <laughs> this is where I am at this stage in my life. Yeah. So I wake up, I journal often, I meditate. That's the first two things, meditate and then journal. And then I'll either go to a yoga class or I'll go to the gym. Um, I will, if my son is with me, we will have breakfast together. We'll often have a cuddle. Even though he's 13, he still cuddles me, which I'm sure he's going to kill me for saying that. (laughs) Um, And then I walk the dog for a good 45 minutes to an hour and then I start work. So it's very indulgent, but it means that I feel, to be honest, I'm nearly, I think we're saying you I'm nearly 50. I I feel great. Like Mm. I feel amazing, you know. I Mm. I'm healthy, I'm happy, but I know that if I don't do those things, I won't feel the way I do. And the older I get, like I was saying to you before we switched the record or hit the record button, 
I don't want to be old and burnt out and not able to move my body. So mobility and mental health are the two most important things to me. And all of my son's stuff is in my diary before anything else. So his stuff takes priority over everything. I will always be there for the things that are important to him. Um, that is what's most important to me. And um that's how I roll. My life's pretty boring, but I like it boring because that means that I'm, you know, not uh, booked back to back, having loads of late nights. Most nights I'm asleep by 9.30, but I get nice. up sleep yeah. simple. I think rather than boring, balanced might be. Yeah, but I like, like I, I'm not, you know, I, I go to events and things, but it's I used mm-hmm. to do a hell of a lot of that stuff and I love connection, but I'm really selective on what I give my energy to because um, I like to give my energy to the work that I love to do. So I do everything around that to make sure that I'm replenishing myself. Yeah. I really love your TED Talk in 2018. Oh, and wow. How you described <laughs> Yeah. Um, And how you described, you know, back in 2014, you realized that you've ticked all of the boxes, but then it wasn't the success, your own definition of success. Mm. And so what would be your definition of success right now? I think there's, there's two ways that I would look at it. And I get reminded all the time. Um, one way would be through the lens of my son and that would be that my son uh, when he's older says that my mum was a loving and caring and she loving and caring mum and she was always there when I needed her that to me would be a massive definition of success um and the second thing would be through my success is through the feedback that I get from my clients and, you know, I had a, a great example, I had a client, you know, um, bring me to tears the other day and I even get emotional thinking about it. And I haven't cried at work since I was at Shell and I burst into tears because I was burnt out, right? <laughs> but these were tears of joy. Um, I just, it's when my clients tell me how much the work that we've done together has changed their lives and I get to watch the impact that they're now having out in the world because most women even if it's just impacting the lives of their children for the better, you know, which is the most meaningful work you can do, want to have some impact in the world. But often um, because of the layers of should, they don't have the space mentally, they don't have the space in time or believe they have the space to do that. So my measure of success is the feedback that I get from my clients and, and also watching them out in the world after they've left me doing the amazing things that they always want to do. You previously shared tips about um, how women can find meaning and uh, purpose in their lives. What about Mm. raising teenagers? Do you have any tips on how to raise a teenage son? There's a couple of little rules I have. And again, I'm unconventional, right? So it's probably not what your listeners are expecting. One thing I did, and it was never through intention, it was completely random, but I reckon it was one of the smartest things I ever did as a parent because it set the foundation for our relationship. And I can't remember, Sax must have been maybe six or seven. And he asked me a question and I told him the answer and I think he was surprised that I was honest because it wasn't, I can't remember what the conversation was about, um, but he knew that it was probably something that a parent wouldn't answer honestly. And... um, he was like, wow. And he goes, um, I think you told me the truth. And I said, I'll always tell you the truth. I said, but let's we're going to have a deal on this. I'll always tell you the truth, providing you agree to do the same. I said, so if we're both honest with each other um, and that's what we use as the basis for our relationship and you know you can come to me and tell me the truth without getting, you know, screamed at, I will always listen. I may not agree but I will always listen and I will not persecute you for being honest with me. Um, I'm happy for that to be our relationship. So you can ask me anything and I'll always tell you the truth, but it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he's not going to tell me everything. I'm not expecting that. But we have 
always had really honest conversations and he tells me a lot of stuff that I know a lot of other parents don't hear. So I feel pretty happy about that. Yep. The other thing I've learned, again, through the work and the study that I've done is the reality is there's no point in worrying about whether you're going to stuff up the kids because the reality is you will, okay? So what what I've learned through my trauma therapy is most children will blame their parents for some problem Something. or issue that they yeah. have, right? That is the basis of it. And the thing is that the parent would have created that issue in some shape or form, but it was unintentional and it was in the moments of everyday life. So Mm. don't sit there worrying about whether or not you're going to stuff up your kids. What Mm. you want to do is worry about the degree to which you do it. And Mm. the only way you can manage that is by looking at your own behaviour and how you show up. And so I'm very cognizant of showing my son that you can do work that is meaningful and impactful and you can care for yourself and have a pretty joyful life in the process. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you want your kids to have happy and joyful lives, they don't listen to what you say, they watch what you do. So your behaviour is going to be what informs that, not the words you say. Yep. How has meditation and yoga practice helped you in this regard, being a bit more self-reflective and mindful of your own behavior towards the people that are closest to you? Mm. I always say yoga is my, like, it's my sanity. I I reckon if I didn't do it, I'd probably be a crazy person. Um, I always find it interesting that people say, I can't meditate. My brain won't be still, right? I've been doing this for probably over 20 years now, both yoga and meditation, and Mm. I still have that. You know, my brain is not quiet. I'm always thinking of ideas. But I have a lot of lot more moments of quiet because I do these things. Yeah. Some days I'll get on the mat and my brain won't, I can't switch my brain off. Mm. And today, like I just did an hour yoga class before I got on this and I was just like, I love doing it in the middle of the day because it's like this beautiful recharger. I was so in it. It was mm. like the world didn't matter. And so I think um, what it's given me is, the practice of presence, which is what most of us want. It's taught me how to bring myself into the present moment more often. So I'm not perfect, but I am way better at it than I ever was because now I have these little tools to go, oh, hang on, my head's somewhere else and Mm. I want to be here. And I actually say to myself, I am here. Mm. And it brings me back. So it's in a, it, it's enabled me to enhance my practice of presence and that's how I look at it. I don't think I'll ever, I don't think, well, unless you're a Buddhist, you know, some amazing monk that's been enlightened, it's yeah. rare you meet someone who is always present, but I'm way better at it than I ever was. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the adaptability researcher that mm. you did a while ago. Are you able to talk to us about it? Yeah, that was some... Um, Never in the plan, but it was a magical thing, right? So probably about six years ago, I probably longer actually, seven years ago, um, I started to notice how many people were unhappy in their lives and a bit like where I was nine years ago, how so many people had um, arrived at this place where they'd been really good at adapting, but the adaption was unconscious. So it was basically I'll just do what I'm told will help me arrive in this magical place of success and then I will be happy. And so I got really curious about the role of adaptability and whether that helped or hindered us in flourishing. So I started looking into journal articles and I did a lot of research and I found that all the psychological research around adaptability was funded by large organisations or the American Department of Defence and the whole angle of it was How do we use adaptability as a means to make people more productive? How do we use it to get more milk out of the cow? And -hmm. what I had noticed was that the productivity um, and the focus on it had actually become our disease. Mm -hmm. And people were so focused on productivity that it came at the expense, especially with women, of they couldn't sit on the couch and relax because it wasn't productive. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, what would it look like if we could teach people how to bring meaning and intention to the forefront of how they adapted? And if they adapted consciously, how would that impact their ability to flourish? So I work with a number of large corporations and we ran a series of workshops to test different skills 
And then we, well, created a psychometry, which was an assessment to actually assess people based on their level of intentional adaptability, which was a concept that I created, which was your ability to make intentional change in a complex and uncertain world that's evolving at speed. Mm. And, um, yeah, lo and behold, the work was published in the American Journal of Psychology Consulting and Deakin University offered up a master's student to help me validate the concept. And, um, yeah, it, it's basically a world-first sort of methodology or framework mm. for helping to pe- people to adapt with intention. Wow. And how do people do that? How can one adapt more to the uncertain surroundings with intention? Yeah, so there's kind of um, six core skills. Mm. So, again, it's a practice, right? There are no silver bullets. So Mm. the skills that we teach people are how to focus in a world that's designed to distract them, Mm. how to take courageous action in uncertainty and use fear as the greatest lever to live the life that you want. Yeah. So we've got focus, courage, um, Oh gosh, I've gone completely blank. Focus, courage. We've got human connection. So how do you actually humanly connect? Because it's fundamental to our health and to our happiness. Um, Accountability. How do you actually focus on that which you can control, not that which you can't? Curiosity. So how do actually be curious in the everyday and not see curiosity as something you do in your spare time of which people tell me they have none. Um, And the other one is reflection. How do you actually create the space to look at what's worked, what hasn't, and consider how you might shift your approach to do better in the future? You are also um, the founder of Hack Happiness. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Hacking Happy Co. um, was basically a rebrand. So the business used to be called something different. Again, it was another evolution. In 2019, um, I was fortunate enough to get uh, a book publishing deal and they asked me to write a book in three months and the book was called Hacking Happiness. Yeah. And it was basically leveraging the intentional adapt- adaptability um, framework to help people live more flourishing lives. And so I wrote the book in three months as someone wow. who, yeah, <laughs> and as someone who'd never written a book before. So I say you're capable of so much more than you realize. If someone had told me that that was possible, I would have said yeah. that was nuts. Yeah. Um, and because the book was called Hacking Happy, and people loved that I called myself a happiness hacker. Mm-hmm. Um, I just felt like the I, the business I'd been in, you know, it was time to kind of freshen it up. And so I was like, well, I'm publishing the book. I'm going to call the company Hacking Happy Co. And basically, again, you know, people connect with happiness, but from a psychological perspective, the term that we use is flourishing because happiness comes and goes. Flourishing is basically a way of living your life. Yeah, it's basically doing meaningful work, having deep connections, Um, that are, you know, rewarding and make you feel mentally well and Mm. being part of something bigger than yourself. And so I was like, you know what, that feels right. And that's kind of how the name was born. I love it. I love that you differentiate um, happiness versus flourishing. Happiness is a state of being versus uh, flourishing as an act of being, of living your life. Yeah, Um, and that's why I say happiness... I think, you know, the reason it polarises people is that people, it's not an end state, it's not a goal, like it's a way of being. And there's beautiful um, research that shows that the happiest people in the world are those who are emo-diverse. And emo-diverse means that these are people that ride the wave of every emotion that life throws at them Mm -hmm. because they know they can come out the other side a little better than what they were before. They don't suppress the bad stuff, which I think society makes us believe, you know, that we've got to make the bad stuff go away. Mm -hmm. And suppressing the feelings that don't feel good if we go back to where we started, you're not paying attention to where there's tension. Yep. I can guarantee you the more you suppress the stuff that doesn't feel good, the more it will come back and bite you in the ass in weird and wonderful ways. Yeah. That's what triggers are. <laughs> mm. Mm. I love it. Okay. Um, I also 
uh, watched your video of explaining um, being comfortable with discomfort. Oh, <laughs> you watched everything. <laughs> I wish I had more time, actually. I was just watching through all of the videos. You have a lot of amazing stuff out there. Um, so check out, um, check out Penny's YouTube videos out there. Uh, but my question is, how do you discern discomfort that needs to be lived through mm. versus discomfort that needs to be left behind? Very good question. I'm just thinking about it because I'm trying to think of any discomfort that it served me to leave behind. I feel like um, the way I look at it is more there is discomfort that needs attention. I, I think any discomfort you feel in your body warrants attention, okay? And I think it's important to say that because we, most of us, most of us these days live in our head and we're completely disconnected from our bodies and how we feel because we've gotten so good at suppressing things and walking over our body's warning signals. So I don't believe that there is any discomfort that sits in your body that does not warrant some attention, some exploration, um, what I would say is once you've given it that attention and that exploration, sometimes you will find that there are things that sit underneath it that you have to let go of. So when you talk about discomfort that you need to let go of, I think that I wouldn't recommend letting go of discomfort until you've explored it within yourself not about going and firing off at other people, but understanding what that discomfort has to tell you and whether that discomfort is serving you, does it need more attention? And sometimes if it is a discomfort that is related to something that is outside of your control that you can do nothing about, mm -hmm. one of the most powerful things you can do, and again, in psychology, this is a proven form of therapy, is to actually give yourself permission to let go. Nice. And how does how does one learn how to let go when it's mm -hmm. when it's uncomfortable when it's extremely uncomfortable? The way I practice it, and like I say, it's a practice, right? You will still get mm -hmm. triggered, and you'll still go, "Oh, why am I coming back to this?" I told myself I would let it go. I, the thing that I remind myself is if it is something that I cannot influence in any way, shape or form, I have to remind myself that that is taking energy away that I could give to something that would actually make a difference in my life, in the life of someone I love or in the work that I do. So I have to remind myself that I am choosing to give my energy to something that I can do nothing about. So if I want to do that, but then what it does is it brings consciousness to the wallowing, to the, you know, <laughs> to whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I think the most powerful thing you can do is bring consciousness to it because then it is a conscious choice rather than you just allowing yourself to be in that state. Yeah, I like it. So it's, it's like going back to that accountability piece of your adaptability, um, knowing what is within your control and what is outside. And when it's the latter, then stopping that Letter piece affecting yourself and your own happiness. Yeah, and it's cho it's all choice, right? It's all mm. choice. Mm. Um, like there are certain people in our lives that will always piss us off, right? We just, it's just the way, and often they're in families. We've all got those people. <laughs> and you can choose to argue with them for the rest of your life yep. and have that energy sucked and know that maybe that situation's never going to change because it just is what it is. Or you can choose to participate and have your energy sucked and that's fine. But I would just say, make sure that if you're choosing it, you're choosing it consciously. Yeah. Rather than being drawn to it. Correct. Okay. Um, if you could give your younger self, maybe that 29 year old Penny, who is right in the cusp of a major transformation in her life, knowing all of the wealth of knowledge that you know now, what one advice would you give the younger Penny?
I would ask her a question I ask a lot of my clients and I would say, how much is enough? Because I feel, I mean, I was, I was always striving and I think we're in a society, you know, where we are sold the idea of constantly striving means that we will be happy. But um, it comes at the cost of rest and joy and presence. And I think if you're not clear on how much is enough, you'll spend your whole life striving and then one day you'll be old and go, I wasn't in life. I wasn't present. And the one thing I hear the most and the one thing that I wanted when my son was young was to be more present. So if you want to be more present, I'd say get really clear on how much is enough. That's what I'd say to Penny. How much is enough? Because I think if I knew, if I had have asked myself that question, I would have realised that I, and my clients say this all the time when I ask them this question, I already had more than enough. Anything else that came along was just kind of icing on top. I already had more than enough. And I still do have more than enough. Yeah, love it. Mm. Okay, uh, one last question that I always ask all guest is do you have an alpha mom song so when things are going crazy at work your son is really on your face with something personal and you don't feel well yourself what one song do you play on the back of your mental mind to make it through the day (laughs) it's so funny Mm. I would say it's probably Katy Perry's Firework. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's mine too. I love yeah. it. And to remind me, you know, that you are a firework, you to shine. Yeah, that would definitely. Okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Penny, for your time. I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, For all breadwinning mums who want to flourish in their lives and finding the purpose, um, uh, how can they find you? Yeah, um, I'm pretty prolific on LinkedIn. You can just find me under my name. Um, You'll also find me on Instagram, Hacking Happy Co., or just go to hackinghappy.co. But, yeah, if anyone's listening and whatever I say has resonated, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'd love to connect. Okay, perfect. All right, then. Thank you so much again, Penny, and I look forward to seeing you continue to flourish. Thanks, Jane. It's been an absolute pleasure. I love your questions. Thank you. See you then. Bye. This episode of Breadwinning Mums was produced by Jane Lim. Our theme music was produced by Sam McNally and we recorded this episode on the lands of dark people who have passed their parenting story for generations and we pay our respects to their elders past and present and thank them for caring for country. Connect with us through LinkedIn at Breadwinning Mums. Until next time.